Hey. Uh. I don't really know what to say right now. Um. I think I let everybody down. He was born in State, Oregon, and he's here to talk about ending the occupations and the war. Ray Harris! Stop clapping! This is not a celebration! This is not a holiday! Because I'm getting out. songs, one of your most favorite lyrics that you wrote? Any one song that you really were just in it? You're in the mode and you just wrote a great lyric to it. The chorus of one is dead politicians, not dead soldiers. <sighs> you're a vet? Did you ever kill anybody? <laughs> You're that? Thank you for your service. Yeah, you know, I couldn't imagine what you've been through. I, I've never been through anything like that. I have no idea. <clears throat> but here's what I think you should do. <laughs> What's your visceral response to that? What do you really want to do to the person? I want to kill them. Do they think that militaries go around spreading freedom? If I had done to you what we did to them, would you thank me? Would you be appreciative? Would you feel free? Mom, dad divorced when I was three months old. Mom was awarded sole custody bounced back and forth between my dad and her. My mom was on the run from uh, an abusive spouse, and so she was bouncing state to state, and I was with her for a pretty great extent of that interesting journey. And he first came around when I was nine, so it was like nine when I first started getting, <laughs> I guess, a sudden influx of a very adult and matured atmosphere, and I had to adapt to it. <laughs> Did you ever have talks with your mom? Why I've called all the time, all the time. Did your dad know this was going on? I kept it from him. And the language barrier between my mom and my dad, you know, given the circumstances of a nasty divorce, he knew, he knew, but there was nothing he could do about it. For a long period, he didn't even know where we were. He showed up when I was nine, and he left for the last time when I was 14. So, fairly critical time in an adolescent you know, young dude's life. <laughs> Pretty critical period of development. Teenager comes into self-awareness at some point, realizes that many of the values that he was taught to uphold by secular and religious institutions may not hold water all the time. Go out and drive in the desert with some friends and heavy metal concerts. I was a big fan of the metal scene. Murder, <laughs> you know what I mean? Especially in Central Oregon. Great, thriving, healthy 
metal culture there for a little while, you know. Metal in general was the avenue that I took to kind of express, you know, I'd write songs, I'd play guitar, blah, 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 and like, you know, death metal. Blah, blah. Madras, Oregon had this amazing little heavy metal club for a long time called The Metal Shop. And I was a fucking whew, die hard for every concert, man. I didn't miss but maybe five. You'd find, you know, bands in the res, DOD, some other ones from other reservations eviscerated. And they would come with some Hispanic bands from Portland and they'd just grind out fucking metal. And you'd be in a mosh pit. Everybody, everybody. <laughs> the mosh pit is a great way to blend culture. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was just Central Oregon culture embodied in fucking death metal. The fine poor. You tell me. Food stamps. Um, small apartment in Section 8 housing. There's definitely people that were a lot more poor than I was. But it's useless if you can be what you want, be what you want. It's too. Until I was 14, the things that were really solidified in me is that self-sacrifice is a good thing. And there's nothing better to do with your life than sacrifice yourself for the direct well-being of others. Include especially someone like your mom. Love. Freaked with a risk. Kept with a kiss. What it is. Having your identity formed by the way that people perceive your academic performance, for me, was definitely one of the things that put me into a more rebellious state of mind. Anyway, it's toxic because you're already dealing with an angry kid uh, confronting, you know, existential existence. Because I wasn't, I didn't fit into the status quo. I, I would participate in every class and I would stimulate discussion. Uh, there was a stereotype in my head all the time in high school about old timers, quote unquote, saying it's got to get back like it's supposed to be. Oh, we and be they had often make this argument that the federal government had overstepped its bounds under the Constitution. And I'd ask my teachers, I'd be like, "What does that mean? Like, what what's the difference between a constitutionally outlined government as it pertains to the American demographic versus what these you know old timers are saying it is?" And they could never explain that. Now, I always thought it was odd that my history teachers could not explain an accurate or at least confident explanation. Not even accurate, just give me something with confidence about what the American government was founded upon. Nine eleven happened when I was in high school. Six days into my high school life, and that really shaped a lot of things, especially in high school, where you know high school is kind of a different staging ground for the identity building of an adolescent. You're in this new awareness of self and of others and of the world, as far as you understand it. Because <laughs> I woke up one day and there's these towers on fire, and I'm like, what the fuck? You get a sense that it's big, especially when you get to school and everybody else. Even though you're only in high school, you all have this overwhelming, foreboding feeling that something wicked this way comes. People from this far part of the world that believe in this certain invisible man wanted to come and kill me and mine and everything I knew simply because. And that we needed good people from this neck of the woods to go do heroic things in favor of freedom, you know, and to liberate people across this land that was so oppressed by these evil, evil dictators. Like, ah. Get those motherfuckers, you know what I mean? I'll do it, I'll do it, I swear to God I'll do it, watch. I remember as I approached graduation, as I approached you know, senior year and got through that, I remember hoping that it wouldn't end. I didn't want it to be over before I got my chance, I wanted to go, you know, I wanted to.
There's a movie we watched when I was in high school. I'll just throw that out there. High school. The movie was called The 60s. There was a clip that they played from a guy named Mario Savio. It was his voice and his words. There was a band that I used to listen to when I was in Idaho called Fear Factory. And it's the Mario Savio speech, the machine speech from the steps of Berkeley. He says that there is a time that the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels and upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. What's the biggest line of bullshit you think we feed our kids, or that you were fed as a kid? Because I work with teenagers, and they hate bullshit. Yeah, they don't know how to articulate the concept no, of bullshit. they don't know how to articulate it, but they know it's out there. They yep. hate being sold. Mm -hmm. And they, they feel it. They, they feel bullshit. it when it comes around. Bullshit? I don't know. Is a combination of authority and expectations. I think that that is what they're talking about. That's what I was talking about. I think every kid's an anarchist. <laughs> I was raised to believe in God, more specifically by my dad. My mom was more about encouraging the idea of believing in just God. When I was 12, I learned that God doesn't exist. It all goes back to the magical stepdad. It was actually on my 12th birthday. My mom in this trailer. I was actually sleeping in a uh, canopy for a pickup outside in the yard. I could tell when it starts getting serious. I could tell I'm used to the pattern. You know, you can hear the wet smack come out of my little thing. I got my BB gun. I got my BB gun. I just got done shooting a fuckload of birds that I know this motherfucker is zeroed. <laughs> my mom's on her stomach face down. Stepdad's on top of her and he's like craning her head sideways, you know. Froze. He's pinning her arms down on his knees. And I saw the point of her chin surpass the point of her shoulder. I just dropped it and I fucking went back into my trailer and I started punching the fucking wall, right? I had already thought about this many times. It's shoot him and then turn it and club the fuck out of him. And I went back in and she's on the couch. She's crying. She's got her hands in her head. She's, I'm like, fuck you, mother. You see that? See, I came in here with an intention. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, ah. Coaxed her out. Get out of here. You're gonna sleep in the fucking. You're sleeping in my house. So she went out there and she slept up there. I sat on top of it until she woke up and da, 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 da. I sat on top of it all night. I was doing that thing, that praying thing they called it, where you like ask for things with the hope that they'll come true. Take my step that away. Take them away. Uh, and then it just hit me. It was like you're looking at stars. You're talking to the sky. You've done this for a while. I felt like I was asking for tangible shit, man. Like this guy's fucking raining hell on me and mine. Stop it. No, it never happened. And then two years later, some might say by the guidance of God, my mom finally kicked his ass the fuck out forever and forgotten. That's my falling out with God. The Christian, the Judeo-Christian, all gone? My two favorite quotes with regards to religion. I don't know what God is, but I know what he isn't. And the other, my religion is known but to myself and to God. That doesn't mean I believe in God. It doesn't mean I don't. It's a nice way of saying you can't tell me what it is, what it's not. I sure as ain't going to tell you what I think it is, because I can't. No more houses of worship for me. No more tribes of devotion for me.
authority and expectation was pissing me off. <laughs> How about girls? Were you good with girls as a no. teenager? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Oh, you know, I was drunk. It was high school. I just graduated. I was shit-faced. I was up drinking Seagram 7 from the bottle. And I called the school that I really care about. And she had already apparently gone off to college. I'm like, oh, wow. Blah, 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 you know, hang up. And I just had this cold realization. Well, and a lot of whiskey. Well, time for you to do something too, my man. I clicked the phone and I pulled out this fucking army recruiter card that my friend had given me. It's like 2.33 in the morning. I want to join the army. Wake up the next day. <laughs> Pull myself off the table. Open the door and there's this dude in fucking jammies and a PC looking down at me. He steps in and he goes to my refrigerator. Pulls up two Budweiser's. <laughs> Opens the computer and he says, what do you want to do? What was dad's reaction? Since joining the military? It's 2005. We got two fresh wars going on right now. You know what you want to do? I was like, I want to be in the infantry. I hear his swallow. He was supportive. You know, he was supportive. So he definitely had a face of apprehension. He never served. He never served. He didn't have to. I do remember mom. She was bawling. And she was telling me, you know, I can live with her forever. Just don't go, please don't go. I was insulted. It's really angry. That you know, you're not behind me, you're not supporting me, you're supposed to go do these things. Everybody has all these expectations. All these authorities have all these expectations and here I am doing my best to try to fulfill them to fucking and that it wasn't even that. It was myself. It was, I wasn't trying to fulfill nobody's shit. I was I wanted to do this because I wanted to go to war. Much time quiet, that's for sure. Reshaping myself, trying to fix. Well, yeah, I've seen Saving Private Ryan. I saw a Platoon. I saw the movies, but I knew, I knew that no movie, no documentary, no, no, no two cents from any vet is going to change my perspective. And I had two very influential veterans in my life prior to joining the military. The first was my grandpa. I never talked about it. But I saw his sacrifice with his missing leg and the, understood it via the stories that my mother told me about, oh, my grandpa was not a nice guy. But the other influential vet came from uh, my old karate teacher. Three tours in Vietnam, several years as special operations Green Beret certified with group in places all over the world doing spooky shit that no one ever heard about. Me and him had a special relationship, so I go to him one day with my contract, and he taps on the MOS code, 11 X-ray. I'm like, yeah, that means I'm going to be in the infantry. He's like, as I recall, I said, would you take it back? And he dropped the paper, looks down, looks back, and says, no. I said, okay. <laughs> he gave me a level of respect that I'd never felt before that I'd never been administered, that I'd never been addressed with. Time. Takes and it talks. Myths and it mocks. Flog in the clock. Basic training lasts how long though? 14 weeks for the infantry. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be intuitive. You don't have to be fucking... <laughs> Just gotta want to fight. <laughs> no. I felt like I was around people that were just like me. And in that sense, that's where you learn to, you know, to really erase all identities. Bravo Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Cavalry Regiment. Bravo Company, 2nd Battalion, 12th Brigade. <laughs> Bravo Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Cav Cavalry, <laughs> Bravo Company, 2nd Battalion, 12th Cavalry Regiment, 
4th Brigade Combat Team, 1st Cavalry Division. Give and they take. I played into the um, group mentality so that when someone was outcast or when someone was quote unquote not, you know, up to par, we ridiculed them. It For me, it was a way of leaving pressure off myself. I've been awkward my whole life. I'm a little smarter. I have a little few abstract ideas. I talk kind of funny some fucking times. Yeah, group punishment. Yeah. Mm hmm. And at Fort Bliss, you could drink. I remember we were all drinking. How would you guys spend your off time? Drinking. Fort Bliss was unique in the sense that it was a military post that allowed soldiers to, to drink at 18 years of age. You got there and all of a sudden I can go in and I can grab the half gallon of fucking Canadian mist. Whether it's directly or indirectly, I would actually say encouraged. The drinking at Fort Bliss was encouraged. Fort Bliss had a lot of problems with resources when it came down to dealing with us when we came back. Fort Bliss was in the unique circumstance to allow youngsters to learn to deal with their problems by drinking prior to this deployment. We got off work and what we wanted to do to forget about everything and everyone and never listen to that, all the bullshit and all the bureaucracy and all the overpressure and the overwhelming sense of authoritarianism over us, we drank. I spent too much time quiet, that's for sure. Reshaping myself, trying to... November 1st, 2006. That's when you flew out? Mm hmm To Iraq? To Kuwait. They stop at Camp Beery and they do what they call staging. Nervous at this point? Being deployed? Terrified. And at the same time we're going up, there's dudes coming south. You might meet them briefly at the uh, commons area in the front of the stage at Camp Buren where bands like Kid Rock and Shinedown have come to fucking support the troops, you know. You might get a chance to talk to them if they want to talk to you. Might not want to talk to you. Because they can tell by your patches and they can tell by your demeanor and your clean fucking clothes. That they, know, they, know that you, they know where you're about to go and they know where they just came from. Scary. Too late now. Too late now. You could have gone AWOL fucking 48 hours ago, but you didn't. <laughs> Is that against the law to go AWOL? Fuck yeah. Well, it depends on the definition of law. But it's frowned upon by people in positions of authority. I gotta get a French press. They throw coffee. Most of the time they break. I know. That's why I don't have one. I get have get a screen and a pot and a lid. And mate, bro. Really? Start drinking mate. Mate's good? For sure. Drink as much as you want. You don't get the jitters. And don't get the fuck. <laughs> get the loose leaf mate from a Mexican market. Got Do it. not get the fucking tea bag. You know, mate. What is important to me? I suppose I've never been asked that question, and that's kind of a hard thing to... Well, it changes, of course. Of course it does, of course, but I've never you been asked that question. You still feel the same way about self-sacrifice. Yeah. Oh, After yeah, absolutely. Done the ultimate sacrifice. Well, I didn't die, I didn't, I, and I got all my shit. If, are you referring to Baghdad? Yeah. Yeah, I know, I got all my shit. I came back with some hurt feelings. We deployed and we were the first unit under General Petraeus' surge plan for 2007, the massive troop increase. We were the first ones in Baghdad. Petraeus' surge plan was to take all these largely combined arms units and put them in outposts. Take them off of the fortified bases, you know, and put them in strategically, strategically relevant locations so that there's a constant presence, that there's a constant operation going on all the time, day or night, 
There's soldiers out and about in the neighborhood. There's no quiet time. There's no time for the quote unquote resistance to formulate an effective battle plan. Hi. Okay. Let me give you a rundown on what's going on right now. Um, I'm pulling guard. I'm in a Humvee in a turret. We're uh, at our little combat outpost deal. Can't really see it. There's a bunch of cement barriers in the way. It's right over that wall. There's a guard tower there. No one mans it though. It's kind of fucked up. Anyway. Here's my sector, what I'm watching. Goes way out down there, those rooftops there, all these rooftops here. Got a 240 Bravo, some 76 two rounds ready to eat some shit up. Got a concertina wire, nice little thing. There's a Bradley down there pulling security that way. More buildings, that's his sector. We got a few mortar rounds hitting. They're being launched from somewhere right over there. I'm not sure where. And uh, they're hitting this mosque. They always like to fuck up. I don't know why. They got problems with each other. Anyway. Saddam was a Sunni. So Sunnis represented 30%, Shias approximately 60, and Kurds 10% in the north. Saddam showed a lot of favoritism. So in his military, largely, the higher ranking peoples this and that were Sunnis. Ghazaliya was a neighborhood reserved specifically for his high ranking military officers. So if you're going to quell the insurgency, find it at its root. When we went in there, we, you know, wiped down the Iraqi military. Their tanks, their support, their uniforms, they didn't want to... All right, who wants to join the new Iraqi military? Well, I've got about a shitload of pissed off Shias that would love to join this Iraqi military. So they do. And all of a sudden, there's this massive Shia militancy. Who, of course, wants revenge. And that led to a lot of um, ethnic cleansing. I think that that's how they actually got everything to quiet the fuck down, was by letting the IA kill every Sunni that they could. At first, it was these houses that we went in. They were pre-vacated, quote-unquote. We gave the people that owned the houses the $100 a month. Broke all the windows, put sandbags up, guard positions, did reconstruction, broke walls down from one house into the next. What was the vision there? Were you meant to, like, interface with Iraqis? Were you meant to sort of work with their police? What were you, I guess, what was the purpose? Spread freedom. No, um... Um, a little tour of the Humvee. This is the turret. Got three inch thick glass. Little joystick that moves the turret that doesn't work. So I have to use this nice little hand crank. Ah, we got a radio here. Call up, say hey, what's going on? We got radios down there. We got some food. The mission textbook was protect the local populace from anti Iraqi forces. Anti Iraqi forces being people that want to fuck with American interests. And I, you know, I that's not the context I put in at the time, that's just how I feel now. No, what was the context you had at the time? At the time, I felt like I was a fucking confused dude who was scared, sitting around a shitload of bodies with this Iraqi guy yelling at me trying to tell me that, you know, it's the Iraqi army killed these guys. The Iraqi army killed these guys. I remember just kind of thinking, what do you want me to do, guy? I'm a fucking private with a saw. Talk to that guy. <laughs> you know. That's pretty much what I've been doing for the past five hours. We got one more to go, and then we're going to get relieved. Go back in and get some sleep for six hours. Come back out and do this at night, which is a lot of fun. There was a mosque called the Mahajariya Mosque in Ghazaliya, Baghdad, right up the street, a thousand meters from Tower One of the outpost. A Sunni mosque on the Shia Sunni borderland of Ghazaliya. You could hear this mosque, and you could see the tracers up the street going back and forth. You could hear the fucking RPGs, you could hear the explosions. Looking this way down the street. And we'd be like, let's go, let's go, let's go, okay, let's go. Never failed. By the time we got to that fucking mosque, which is right down the road, you can see it down the strip. All gunfire had ceased, and all fucking, it was, everything was done. 
most of the time you'd have a whole bunch of dead mosque attendees. You'd have a whole bunch of dead people. And you'd have the Iraqi army and their Humvees have their fucking turrets pointed toward the mosque. Fucked up folks all around. This guy's pointing at the Humvee to my left. And there's this guy, he's got one of these on, US issued helmet. And he's telling me they did this, that did this. And I'm asking my interpreter. And I was like, what's he saying? He's like, he's saying the IA killed these men. The Iraqi army death squads would go down street by street, killing everybody inside, burning out house, burning out house, burning out house. It's dead silent except for like the odd smell of fire searching for fuel. And you can smell the Texas chainsaw barbecue of what's inside of those fucking houses. And you're on guard the next day and then people are coming up saying, hey, my, my husband was kidnapped last night. My dad was kidnapped. My son is missing. And you're, I was a kid. You don't know how to react. You don't know how to fucking comprehend what they're really trying to tell you. The language barrier, it's fucking hot. You're supposed to hate these fucking people. It's tough, so you just try to ignore them. Baghdad 07, kidnappings, body dumps. Sectarian conflict, they called it. It was just some unfounded, strange war between Sunnis and Shias. Like it just popped up out of nowhere. People were trying to kill us. There's more U.S. casualties in 2007 than any other period in the Iraq war. Problem was, not only did it look just like the people that didn't want to kill us, so it's hard to tell one from the other, but also, I think that they had realized that their best bet was to hit us when we're driving down the road, and that's what they were doing. They called them oh boys. Oh boy is an IED, improvised explosive device. The roadside bomb is what they call them here. You don't see them, they just blow up. Did you have to go door to door and, and arrest, mm -hmm. bring people in for questioning, etc.? In the middle of the night, to take the man out of the house? Everybody in Iraq was allowed to have an AK-47. These people had these when Saddam was in power? Of course, absolutely, all of them did. For sure. It's part of the, it's part of the rules. <laughs> in case an invasion occurs. Why weren't more of you guys blown away then when you went knocking on doors to humiliate these people? It's not because they liked us. Because they would have gotten blown away right back. I think that's part of it. Fuck it. They liked us. <laughs> no, I don't know. But that's a good question.
everybody goes blank at first. But you pull it back together. When bullets are close, when it's personal, there's not a whiz, there's not a wah, there's not a wham, it snaps. It snaps in a way that you can almost see where they're at. given some sort of vision? Or were you under that premise of you were going to be liberators? Soldiers on a battlefield are not fighting for freedom. We're not fighting for a flag. We're not fighting for a politician or a political party. We're fighting for the men with guns. Hey, if it fucking has to happen, take me. Let these motherfuckers go home. When I'm dead, I got nothing to worry about. You're dead. You don't have formation tomorrow. Doesn't matter if your gun's clean or dirty. You don't have to worry about pulling the six. That's the battlefield mantra, you know. Take me, not them. The sewer system was bombed and the raw sewage was all over the streets. That fucking deep sometimes. Kids would just run through it, go to school. They dropped a JDAM in Mosul, big fucking bomb. And it's usually dropped on enemy positions, enemy targets, fortified compounds. They use them a lot in Afghanistan. Iraq's sewer system was all interconnected into one giant network. And when they dropped that particular JDAM, it clogged up and backed up the entire fucking country sewer system. Sewage, all, just, you know, all over the fucking place. All those people's doorsteps sometimes. <sighs> they didn't want us there. Some people like you. The other ones that I think that say that they like you and they act all friendly, it's probably out of fear. You're scary. Why wouldn't you be? You can see bullet holes all up and down these fucking streets. They weren't here before we got here. You get different reactions. I have good memories and bad memories of those people, but I'll tell you what. None of them have big fangs. I came to find... I came to find that the people that I was sent to fight were a lot more like me than the people that sent me to fight them. March 17th, 2007, we had pulled back into the motor pool after pulling a big mission, and then we hear an explosion. You all hear a lot of explosions. This is a big one. So I grab the gun. He was a lieutenant. He comes running out. Hey, we got casualties. Red platoon's got. He said the word. He said KIA. And it was 
surreal at the moment killed in action he says hey i need a gunner and i was like i got you sir and we whiz past tower three and we're the first ones jetting out everyone else is getting late and i see this giant crater and i'm in the gunner's hatch right and we can hear the fucking firefighter raging from all the way down the street and then there's this carnage you know we got a rooftop right here and i see uh i see red platoon soldiers you know and they're fucking ripping saws down the fucking street you know. m249 and at4 is going off anti-tank fucking you know i didn't see who was shooting those but they weren't mortars coming in and they were big they weren't rpgs i hear yelling a oh, faintly over gunfire and where the humvee is flipped over at i see two soldiers on top of this two-story house like, and they're waving, get out of the way, get out of the way. Because the dudes that are picking up fucking remnants of soldiers, they were yelling at them, get out of the way, look out. And then these two soldiers on the roof push over a fucking door from this Humvee. This thing weighs six, eight hundred pounds. And it managed to find its way on top of the second story roof. The other LT on site was in shock. He was on the roof laughing upside down. I'm like, in shock. Because he just had four men evaporated. The Humvee is dangling on the front. It's got Gru inside. Gru meaning human soup. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, it's got Gru. A guy comes up from a Humvee and says, do you all have body bags? I'm like, why do you need body bags? He says, well... They found more remnants back at the CAS site. Okay. They got more remnants back at the CAS site. As he's getting the body bags, across the street, I notice that there is a large gathering of what we would have called military-aged Iraqi males, and they are chanting, smiling, laughing, thumbs upping, and they're wreckages, but they know what happened. They were, of course, they knew. I had every means at my disposal to make myself feel better. Didn't. But that's when a sense of self-realization and your role and thing kind of started to kick in. And this is our driveway. We never face attacks on this way. We assumed it's because everybody here loves us. So that's how we were received. I was driving, I was in this Humvee, and there's a swarm of kids that surrounded the Humvees, and that happened all the time. And I was smoking a cigarette, and I'm just staring at the steering wheel. I was not feeling the kid. I look up, and through this, you know, masquerade of young kids, about 15 yards, I see this little girl covered in dirt. You know, on her face, she's wearing ratty white clothes, and you know, dirt stains, and green stains on the cuffs of her things from the sewage water, walking around, and ratty hair. I pulled my window down. These were the latch and pulled down one. So I <laughs> pointed at her and I called her over. She came over. I gave her a fresh cold bottle of water. And so she opened the water bottle as she walked to the rear and she stopped right in the rear of my rear view mirror. Some kid wearing an olive green shirt pushes her. I see her. She disappears. Then he bends down and picks up and all of a sudden he's drinking the water in my mirror. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Pull back the door, get out, M249. Again. Hey! <laughs> Grabbed it, balled him up. So he runs off around the corner. I yelled at my gunner. I said, hey, pull me out another bottle of water. <laughs> I took a knee with my saw and um, called the girl over, opened it up, gave it to her. I sat there on a knee and I made sure she drank it all before I went back into that fucking Humvee. I made her sit there and drink every drop. She got her water. Mistakes you saw your fellow soldiers make, or one mistake, or 
a superior knows. Aside from the whole Iraq war, Afghanistan with the whole war on terror, aside from those mistakes they were made. At Casino, we had a shower that would function, but the water reeked of raw sewage. <laughs> Were you aware that the military in Rumsfeld did not get along? No. I knew that me and a lot of the local populace didn't get along. <laughs> and they didn't get along with my friends. <laughs> so. When did you realize the mission, whatever that was, didn't fit your original vision of going over there? Or being a soldier? Um, we raided a house, and this is in the summertime, uh, tumultuous time, summer 2007, very tumultuous time in Iraq. Anytime you go into a house, anytime you run up all the people, so there was only um, two women and this mentally inhibited man. And I was asked to pull security, which is to overwatch them to make sure that they don't pull a suicide vest. Watch them, they might kill you. Okay. We have our faces painted uh, with soot from the trash pit that we burned in front of our outpost because that's how we got rid of garbage and burned it. And so one night we're feeling a hardcore before this badass raid that's supposed to be super promising. And we're like, all right, jackpot. This is going to be something. They're, of course, crying. They're distraught. They're not happy. Old boy is not comprehending the reality of the situation he's in because that's just not how his brain works. He's looking at me, you know, and looking around and... The old ladies are just bawling, you know, they're, they're ready to take their hands off, and they're like, oh, what's that? And they're pointing to him, and they're and he's screwy. To which I respond, shut the fuck up. And we're in there for 30, 40 minutes, tearing everything apart, you know. And I'm just watching these two while their whole hidden existence, they're probably escaping death squads while they're in this hideout right here. So we leave, and then we come back a week or not long later. So we stack on the same door, and my squad leader says, weren't we just here? And I remember right before we started smashing the door and like, yeah, like a week and a half ago. And here I am again. And I'm still keeping the posture. Freedom posture. I'm like, I'm here to liberate you with my fucking M249. And it's still the same dude. He's looking at me the same way. And they're giving me this screwy gesture, you know. But it was that odd deja vu, that fucking really morbid replay that made me realize who the bad guy is. Up to that point, every little detail of, you know, good, bad, this and that started to kind of settle into a context that I'd never, context that I'd been resisting. At what point did you think to yourself, now there's nothing for it going home? When mom you died? Day I got there. I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna go home. <laughs> you know, like, oh my god, tits up, belt in, slapping the fucking belt. I wanna go home. <laughs> you, know, like, you just wanna go home. You just wanna go home. I call it apostasy. The word is apostasy. Which means what? Realizing a new set of ideals through experience and self-awareness. I went into the war believing that it was good and just. I left believing the exact opposite. Apostasy. A change of mind, but on a philosophical, fundamental level. 
with every uh, advancement and disillusionment, it didn't lead to enlightenment with these new ideas. It led to more disillusionment, and I just wanted to go home all the more. But you did say earlier you wanted to be a soldier. You wanted to go to war. I still wish I was back. I still wish I was there fighting. Even Life though, is easier. Even though... Life is, is easier? It's... You got an identity, you got a role. You, you got, know, yeah, you have an identity, you have a, a role, you have a social circle, you have... You friends. Relatively easy job. And you got friends, you got a paycheck, you got... Because rationally, I realized that it's not a fun spot to be. It's a lot of hard work, and then... It's easy to forget out about all those really vast expanses of boredom that are usually filled with discontent for the institutions that put you there in the first place. I call it the saltwater analogy, the salty fish analogy. We're all born into fresh water. Some people, they choose to leave the fresh water and they go into the salt water. They have to change. If they survive the salt water, they, they go back to the fresh water. But now you have a salt water fish in a fresh water pond. The fresh water, it's never comfortable. It's not home. It's not inviting. Because all the fucking fish around you have no idea what salt water is like. Abu Ghraib? What do you expect? That's the kind of mentality you need to nurture in people if you want them to conduct warfare under your wishes. You need to make them dehumanize people and you need to make them separate themselves. That's Abu Ghraib. Don't confuse the war with the warrior. That's the Afghan kill team. The guys from Fort Lewis that were in Afghanistan killing innocent civilians for sport. Shooting them, cutting off thumbs. Not my cup of tea. But you don't confuse the war with the warrior. Don't show me a picture of a private smiling next to a fucking corpse and call it a war crime. Show me people in suits and ties, smiling, signing papers. Because that's a fucking war crime. That's where the war crime is. There's business suits and combat boots. One is business. People in the military, largely, until you get to the very high ranks, largely, by and large, were yes men. Don't be surprised when that happens and you send people to war. All of a sudden... <laughs> Your military is not marching down the streets with flags and parades, passing out candy. All of a sudden, they're doing what militaries do, and they're exerting force upon populations. On your behalf, you paid for it. Don't act like you're against the war while you sign your fucking tax receipt. You're more responsible for bloodshed than me. You demonize the soldier. You demonize the, the troop. The individual at the lowest level for the monstrosities and the atrocities of war that you are condoning, but <laughs> financing, and perpetuating by apathy. And then we come back and you want to assume that this institution called VA can somehow manage us because that's your only hope. You want us to be taken care of. You support your fucking troops. But you only support veterans when they come back in the picture-perfect mold of what you think veterans are supposed to be. We're not supposed to come back pissed the fuck off. We're not supposed to come back militant. And we're not supposed to come back with a big chip on our shoulder. We're supposed to shut the fuck up. We're supposed to be paraded in front of you on Veterans Day and Memorial Day. So you can clap and cheer and wave your fucking flags. But you don't ever have to fucking listen to us. This idea of reintegration of veterans? Myth. Reintegration is the myth that society somehow facilitates a mechanism, a function by which veterans can come back and live, pick up where they left off. 
reintegrate into productive members of society. <laughs> it's not us that need to reintegrate into society. It is society that needs to reintegrate to us. We already changed. You sent us there's been 10 fucking years. 1.5 million through Iraq alone. Afghanistan's not over. 1.5 million through there too? In 2009, the Department of Homeland Security and numerous federal agencies have echoed this exact same sentiment, saying that returning Iraq Afghanistan veterans are a terrorist threat to America. Yeah. MIAC report, MIAC, Missouri Information Analysis Center. Why would they say that? Why would they say that? I thought I was your friend. How am I the bad guy? What do I know? I know how to fight. I know that I have a lot of friends out there who are just as pissed off and just as fucking disgruntled as I am. when we had a march here for Occupy in solidarity with uh, our boy Scott Olson, USMC Iraq War veteran, caught himself a fucking tear gas canister in the skull. The veterans led the march. That's why the, it went as far as it did. That's the only reason. That's the only reason why they ended up having the whole fucking force out is because the people leading it weren't going to take no for an answer. I would be willing to wager that Per capita, veterans as a demographic minority are killed by police officers more so than any other demographic minority. Along racial, cultural, or religious lines, look a bill, Nicholas look a bill, Oregon National Guardsman, shot in Vancouver, Washington as he was on his way home, on his way to his grandmother's house, leaving his mother's, who was with his girlfriend. He had a bad night. Kid wasn't used to drinking. Got back from Iraq, drank some of these things uh, for. Four local. He didn't have to die. Neither did Andrew McDowell. Anthony McDowell, I'm sorry. On Gresham. Cops showed up because he was having a bad day. His wife called the police. She didn't know what to do. You're supposed to be able to call the police and they're going to come help him. Husband's having a bad, stereotypical fucking veteran day. He's a vet. He's entitled to have a shitty fucking day. And they show up, park a few blocks away, turn their lights off, rush up on him like a fucking hit squad in the dark. And they fucking killed him. He's a homeless dude. He's sleeping in his fucking stoop. Because he's got nowhere to sleep. Cops bust in on some, and some reason to bust in. And this fucking poor homeless guy wakes up, grabs his machete, because that's all you got. And they pump him full. That's just Oregon. That was in like a four month span. This happens all over the nation. Eagle Point, there was a cat that got fucking smoked up by a cop. And Eugene, the son of a fire chief, I think it was, um, last year, was paralyzed permanently because he had a bad day and he went around shooting his gun in the parking lot. Cops showed up, chased him downtown on a low-speed chase. He was giving him some shit, as I understand, reaching in, coming out, I don't have a gun, I don't have a gun. And then I guess at some point they just said, fuck it, and... You think vets will ever take up arms against? I think it's happened a few times before. More important question. Can you think of a reason why they shouldn't? They swore to support and defend a principle, an ideal that is freedom, uninhibited, anti-authoritarian freedom. All we have is a militarized police state. It's a hell of a thing when people who were sworn to support and defend an idea document specifically, but the, more importantly the principles laid forth therein, 
against those who would work to infringe upon it. They go somewhere to do fighting against people that are not the domestic enemy or the enemy that they swore to support and defend against. But when they come back, they might find that the people that sent them to do that in the first place are in fact the same people behind the same machine that are supposed to be stopped. Did you know you were going to go back to Iraq from day one? They told us very shortly after we got back that we were prepping for another deployment. And I was like, What was your emotion? Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. For what? All that shit we accomplished? We got back, and I was the, I think, first person in my unit that said, I can't sleep. All of a sudden, we have a 9 to 5, so to speak. Get back up at 4 a.m., do your thing, da 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 I still don't know how to fall asleep in terms of a schedule. So we go to the doctor, and I tell the doc, Doc, I can't sleep. And he's like, have you ever heard of Ambien? I'm like, no. But you have to make sure that you take it at least eight hours before you you have to wake up. I'm like, okay. They picked me up from the mental health clinic, you know. One of my friends says, don't take that shit and stay awake, man. It'll fuck with you. Back of my head, really? Thus began a long experimentation in the idea of self-medication. I came to find out that if you take Ambien and stay awake, you will become intoxicated. If you take seven of them and chase it with fifth of Cuervo, you have an average night. When I had a bad night, when that girl that I called, we were involved at the time. That's a soldier's nightmare. That happens to everybody. That always, that's always going to happen. Soldiers don't have loved ones for very often, very long. Took a bunch of Ambien, drank a bunch of booze, passed out on my bed. The squad leader comes in the next day because I'm late for formation. And he comes in and he shakes me, and I'm not waking up. Ends up taking me to the medic station as I'm coming to, because I'm coming out of it and I'm realizing, oh God, now I'm in the hands of my squad leader and I'm going to talk to the big wigs. Okay. And that's when the first time I got in trouble. It wasn't a hospital trip. Second time. I was already at this other unit where they send six soldiers to go get better, which is basically this pill distribution fucking area. Because I'm getting out on a psyche valve when I'm the only one that needed to go for help. And we all went through the same bullshit. Took a lot of pills when I was there, because like I was saying, they give you a lot of pills at units like that. They're trying to get you better. With their explicit sole mission of getting you back into the into the fray. You know what I mean? I didn't want to go back into the fray. They put a lot of guys on pills? Can they give counseling and all? I mean, would it even be effective? I mean, that's just a joke. If you put us in a room and we're all from different units and we all were in different spots doing different things, there's going to be these walls up and you're not going to get us to open up in front of each other. You're not. You're not going to get us to just open up in front of each other, especially when the people mediating the whole idea of this fucking circle jerk are people that learned about what we're going through from fucking books and from professors from fucking colleges. They make you take them, because if you don't take them, you can get in trouble sometimes. Well, so You're force medicated in a roundabout sense. You face UCMJ, UCMJ. Discipline, Uniform Code of Military Justice. You face UCMJ disciplinary action if you don't take the fucking Pfizer cocktail that they want to shove into your bloodstream and up your fucking brain pipe. Jesus. Yeah. I feel like everybody's looking down on me because... They feel like I'm a pussy. 
I've been going to mental health for months, man. Months. And they weren't helping me. And this is fucking insane. It sounds so weird to say, but I swear to God, it's true. My right index finger would bump all through the night, like tick, 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 tick. I stand it. It's bumping. It's fucking. It's glitching. And it was doing it for weeks. They gave me this shit called Tegretol, which is some kind of spasm mitigating, you know, pharmaceutical, and Xanax. Clonopin, um, drinking or not, I give a fuck. Oh, it's because you drank, or it's because you were taking it as directly, or it's because oh, you were doing it sporadically. Or blah, 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 blah. Fuck you. All the cocktails were Speridone, some kind of crazy antipsychotic that I was supposed to dissolve in my mouth. Ativan. I'm just self-medicating here. I got some beer. I got a line of Clonopin here. Which I'm pretty sure is a fucking placebo. Because the doctors at mental health on on bigs think I might be fucking around. Effects her? But I'm not. Effects is a hell of a drug. Don't take that if you ever plan on getting off of it. No, that not from me because I got out and I dumped all my pills out the day or two days after I got out of the army. I dumped all my pills out because I was such a cloud nine that there's no way that any real pharmaceutical withdrawal is going to affect this. Were you issued a military-issued Bible at any time? No, I wasn't issued one, but they gave them out. We also say that it's not a holy war. If you're a Muslim in a Muslim nation on the Eastern Hemisphere and you hear a force that calls itself a Christian force pillaging your country based on false premises, it looks a lot like holy war. Christianity is imposed. Imposed? No. Uh, yes. Indirectly. They're called chaplains. They're people, they're the spiritual advisors of the military. And in the U.S. Army, they have a little patch that's a Christian cross. And on the top of every fucking chapel, there's a cross. These non-denominational houses of worship. People aren't there to defend Jesus. Or no. Or oppose Jesus on Islam. Heard that a couple times from some people's mouth, but... It was more like the regurgitation of some sick rhetoric that even they couldn't believe. There was this company called Trigicon that makes gun sights and they are weapons optics, and they were sending weapons optics to Iraq, to Afghanistan, that had Bible verses on the fucking serial number, you know. Is the claim that we're there for oil really true? I don't know. I don't know what's there. I didn't see a lot. We weren't there to spread freedom. You think we really were, but we just weren't getting to the point where we wanted to get to? Do you think there was a real, true, altruistic drive? Why did this send kids with guns? If it's such a good fucking idea, why, why do you need all that? There are forces and factions within the nation of Iraq that will never ever forgive and they will never forget the fact that their government is a puppet government that was blatantly installed under false pretenses imposed upon them forcefully violently um, by the West Did you ever sense that your leaders in your company were confused about the vision, about the orders they were being given, that they felt like... Nobody knew what the fuck was going on. Did you ever see yourself as a catalyst for change in the Middle East? No. Political responsibility was given to military commanders. Like they were the, the military commanders were the ones meeting with the sheiks. Mm -hmm. Sheiks? And... In effect, it wasn't it wasn't diplomats and ambassadors and politicians. No, leaders. It was military guys. It's it soldiers there to impose military force and military might. Did the military feel comfortable in that role? 
in opposing that? That's what militaries do. I think we were right at home. <laughs> They didn't give a fuck about us. Even though the stories of Bush going to obviously the VA to see these wounded soldiers. Fuck him. He didn't go to no chapel service overseas. Ten hours after fucking soldiers were wiped off the face of the earth. When they go to places like that, it's called a photo opportunity. It's them taking advantage of their victims to make themselves seem better, more benevolent, caring. People who are the victims of natural disasters or of attempted, you know, murder attempts, they don't go through a process. They don't voluntarily, nonetheless, subject themselves to a process that breaks down the foundations of their psychology and builds it up in a new imprint, like basic training. Simultaneously, they don't have that new foundation reinforced a thousandfold permanently forever by something like 14 months of deployment. That's the difference between the soldier's PTSD, as they call it, and the other stuff. What should they call it? Cause and effect. How about normal? They should call it normal. What have soldiers done from time immemorial when they come back from a battlefield? This is normal. Suicide, depression, fits of anger, run-ins with the law. <laughs> getting fucking smoked by cops. This is normal. There's no disorder about this. This is the order that it goes in. Talk more about the suicide rate. 18 per day. Oregon National Guard has had more suicides um, in fiscal years than other any other branch. We had suicides in us in basic training. And not only does it have to do, I think in my own opinion, with the rigors of a military lifestyle, but it's also coupled with the nature of people that are being recruited. These are lower class folks. These are people who have fucking troubles from the get go. Now you're gonna stick them in the machine. Do you find an immaturity amongst people in the military? I couldn't recognize it. I know I was immature as shit. When I was there, I remember I used to say, you know, I really found myself out here. I really found myself. I have more of an ideal understanding of who I am. No. You're just now beginning to get lost in the sauce. I need help. And the only person I could talk to and I, I just tried calling him and he wasn't there. Are there other things, other speeches, other bits and pieces of things you've memorized because it means something to you? You can't conquer a free man. The most you can do is kill him. Who said that? Robert Anson Heinlein. Who's that? I have no idea. It's just a quote I heard and I looked it up and I remembered it forever. What's changed is my understandings of morality. Right and wrong. What's the same? I'm still more than willing to fight and die for what I believe in. Which is? So I'm gonna keep snorting these fucking placebo pills and drinking the beer to numb the pain. Stop war.
Do you think that's as naive of a belief as your belief at 14 no. in your country? No. Or in the military? No. So this one? The idea of spreading freedom with M249s and frag grenades was, was an incorrect perspective. This perspective you have now about stop war, do you think in 10 years you'll reflect on that and think that's quite ridiculous as well? Depends on whether or not I try as hard as I did to spread freedom as I do to stop war. How are you attempting to stop war or will you attempt? That's an odd question to answer. I know the answer. It's not sure how to articulate it. Who wants war? Do you want war? No, I don't either. Good chance your neighbors don't either. And in communities all across America, there's a really good chance that the people you were to ask directly, do you want war? No, they don't. They'll be tricked into encouraging it. They'll be led to believe that it's necessary and an only option. By who? By politicians. It wasn't easy for me. And I know it wasn't easy for any of y'all. So don't be fucking playing it like it was. Like it was nothing. Because I know you're all having fucking problems. If you can make people who wear business suits realize that when they step on that fucking podium and they start mongering for violence against nations and peoples for whatever reason. I think that they should understand that they stand to lose. Did you learn anything about the Iraqi people? Did you interface enough with them? They make very good falafels. And they're very hospitable. Even when you come out of their house by force, they will often sometimes still serve you tea and give you little treats. Chai. Not tea. Chai. Worst place I had to take a shit was actually a... Uh, wow, that's a pretty good one. In this Humvee, it was me in the gunner seat and my buddy in the driver's seat. So this one time, it's like... <laughs> and so I found this what's called a wet weather bag in the back. Open it up and I find all these blue shop towels. I'm like, ah, you know. Take a dump all the towels out on the seat, roll the thing into a bowl, pull my britches down, and I shit. And these Iraqi kids playing on the side of the street, they can see the Humvee window. I'm in the turret and I look up and I'm looking down and I'm looking up. And they're pointing and laughing, you know. And they totally see me and they're bare assed, you know. And Wilson, God bless him, he lights up a cigarette trying to cover up the smell. And uh, I get it done and. <laughs> You know, the shop towels to appropriate use. And um, grab the bag and tie it off by its two strings. And then put it in the seat. That was it. I had the shit. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. We're, getting, we're, we're banging through my I thought I could outlast you. Oh, shouldn't I get two pages? <gasps> we're skipping through a lot because you either answer them or they're ridiculous questions. When you, when you were deployed, how long did you think you were going to be there? Forever. Did you not feel proud to wear the uniform at any time? Oh. Yeah, I, mean, I love that. I love that shit, being suited up and booted up and walking around like a fucking Terminator. Did you ever abuse your power, whatever, whatever that means? Yeah. That's what war is, right? It's a vulgar display of power. <sighs> Plus, I'm pretty sure that these fucking pills that they gave me 
these clonopin something just to make me think that I'm feeling fucking better. I know your shit's not working because I've taken about 15. And it's not helping with the anxiety or the depression. Life after Iraq. So, the six months, you spent time in the hospital. Is that what you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. as well? How long was that? Uh, final stint was two weeks. May 14th is when I was admitted. It was four... I got out around methadone overdose. Methadone is the replacement heroin, heroin treatment, yeah. Methadone treatment, yeah. Right. And also an you extreme opiate painkiller. Yeah, I fell downstairs. I Fuck. went up in the ER. I was fucked up. That so, dilated so fucking well, all sorts of opiates. When did you start going on methadone? When I found out that I could buy it from a connection. I'm face up, covered in foam, purple, and, and shedding skin. And I had foam coming out of my ears and my no, no. Took me to the hospital. ICU, three days, four days. Flew the whole family down. They thought I was gonna die. I was supposed to die, for sure. Oh yeah. Then we moved right in with uh, my ex-girlfriend. Depression? Yeah. Suicide ideation? Mm -hmm. I'd be lying if I said no. And so would just about every other veteran out there. Um, outbursts, things I can't contain, you know, things I don't understand, feelings, vibes, like getting tremors at night, having nightmares, shaking. I have to double check the doors. I have to, uh, I slept with a uh, SIG 556 onto the bed. Uh, it's a carbine rifle. Flashbacks? Kind of a funny term. Um, I've definitely responded to stimuli in a combat capacity. Life after Iraq. You're radical now? What's the word for you? Comfortable. Comfortable. I've come to a sense of rationalization and understanding for things and why and when and blah, 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 that I'm starting to feel a little more comfortable with. How long has it been now since you got back? Four years. Don't take any medications. Don't go to VA anymore. How do you get any sort of value out of your experience? Meaning of value. Instead of running from them, you have to embrace them. You have to make your past work for you, not against you. Is that possible? Time will tell. For some guys, it's not impossible to kill themselves. Yeah. What, do you, what would you tell a veteran who's considering suicide? I'd say let's talk. He lays it all on the line for you. He doesn't believe he's ever going to heal. And you understand that. What's, what do you say? Would you ever counsel someone into suicide? No, fuck no. Hell no. We can't, us other vets, no one's else going to look out for us but each other. We can't have, can't have one of my own falling off. Counsel them and no. No, that's what VA does. <laughs> that's what VA is for. VA is there to counsel you into suicide and like a pat on the shoulder and a, hey, why don't you just go eat shit and live, bro? Crawl into a dark hole and eat shit and live. <laughs> that's what VA is for. What's the source of suicide ideation? Is it the stress of, of these horrific um, 
observations and experiences? Is it the uh, inability to integrate? Is it the lack of understanding of family, friends? Is it the lack of uh, self-respect after maybe reflecting on what you did? Depression? Combination of all of the above, the inability to form relationships, meaningful relationships, the inability to hold them together, especially with those that you know you really want to love and care about. You know, these kids, and we were kids, we're always kids. These kids are forced into situations where they have to deal with extremely deep existential realities. Normally people's friends and the people around them, they don't witness death and, death and heavy shit until they're old. And you're around people that aren't on your page, cannot understand, do not speak your language. Especially with the bullshit that goes on. Remember, the authority coupled with the expectation of veterans. You're supposed to reintegrate and do this great prosperous thing and go work for this good money job because you got these skills that no one else has. The military taught you fucking right. Or some fucking myth. Do you think statistically that the, the, the government actually prefers when a, a veteran commits suicide? So he's got one, the government has one less... Mm -hmm. Paycheck? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you regret military service at all? No. But simultaneously, I would never <laughs> advise it to someone else, ever. How much do you live with it every day? We're dying! Every day. People are clapping, they got a fucking gospel band on stage for a half hour talking about Jesus this, and then the mediator, we have, there's a reverend fucking mediating the whole thing, and then I look around and I see all these professional activists. These aren't people that give a fuck, these are people that are there because they're seen, and they've been there for a long time, and they always will be there, they're the sexagenarian leftists. They're the fucking hippies in their 60s. They're the fucking... And now, our government is taking it upon itself to start killing people in Pakistan with your money! Like, oh, hello, hello, Diane. Oh, hi, Rick. How are you? I haven't seen you since the Worker Solidarity March back in May. You know what I mean? Like, it's just the... Two days ago! Two days ago! 38 people were killed in Pakistan! I'm not gonna sit up there. I wasn't gonna entertain these people. I wasn't gonna be their fucking again that caricature where I sit up here and I speak eloquently you know, about the problems of the world and militarism and imperialism and all these leftist fucking comfortable terms, especially in a pacifist platform. So I got up there and I gave them what I was feeling. Here's some faces you don't see on the news. These guys were killed in Iraq, St. Patrick's Day, 2007. And it happened to make a lot of them cry. I guess some people were expecting me to go up and help propagate that party atmosphere because it's a social event now. Protests and demonstrations are a social event, especially with the, uh, the election of a Democratic president. It's okay for him to kill people. We won't say a fucking word because he promotes health care. But I know the people were A-OK -okay with him slaughtering children via drone strikes that he fucking orders. At least when Bush was president, people protested. Man, the idea that somehow one can be worse than the other, and they're both fuck faces. This is a this culture is a celebration of self and consumption and and civilization and just selfishness overall, overall with no concept of or at least very little of your individual actions as they relate to the relationship of those around you. I was in, in Iraq on Memorial Day, I realized that like, this is Memorial Day, that means everybody's at home fucking party and have a good time, da, 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 da. it's like, we got dead fucking soldiers over here, what is there to celebrate, you know? And one of my team leaders was like, oh, you'd be doing the same thing, you'd be doing the same thing if you were there, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Any buddies you lost to live that you really missed? Oh.
to my true friends, and you know who you are, the ones who stood by me, through thick and thin, who never poked fun, who never tried to man me down for shit that I did, or for shit that we went through when I was going through the personal shit when we were in Iraq. And I commend you and to every, all the naysayers, to all the shit talkers, fuck you. What do we need to do to move on? What do we need to do as, as a society? Dead politicians, not dead soldiers. folks yeah you know the kind the warmongering tax thieves that tell us the lies steal our fucking money to pay for their crime they start the wars, they show no remorse for the mothers who mourn when their children die. Motherfucking politics. 